Welcome to Modern Aikidoist Podcast. My discussion today is with Reg Sakamoto, who has a long and diverse background, which I'll let him describe. Before we start, I want to thank everyone who has supported the show, and in particular those of you who have contributed to the PayPal tip jar. Of course, the likes, subscribes, and shares help a great deal as well. I enjoy bringing you this content, and the contributions help cover the expenses for doing so. I've had a wonderful time chatting with the people on these shows, so much so that I would like to have them back for further conversations. As you listen, if there are any questions or topics you would like to hear us discuss, please post up a note in the comments or send me them directly. I'll pick the best ones and we'll cover them in future episodes. Another way you can get more content is to join the Spirit Aikido online program. There are more than 110 videos in the program currently, with new ones added every few days. Subscribers get access to video training and mentoring to techniques and training methods that I've adopted from other martial arts to make my Aikido more practical. In the most recent videos, I cover the fundamentals of the body lock, as well as practical entries and solid takedowns from there. I've also covered a variety of heel hooks and how to train them. There's a link to the program in the description. I invite you to check it out. Now, on with the discussion. Well, I'm here with Reg Sakamoto. Uh, very much looking forward to this conversation. He's got a fascinating background, uh, both in Aikido and, and weapons and just an interesting man in general. And I've been very much looking forward to having a conversation. So welcome, Reg. I'm glad we could hook Thank up. Thank you, sir. Um, great to have you here. And why don't we just start out and you can give a little bit of your background so people can understand just uh, how many interesting things you got your hands into. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I started martial arts in 1976. Um, so I got into it because I had problems with, uh, bullying, mm. not that I was a bully, but that I had problems being bullied. That, you and know, that's so, what brought me to martial arts as well. I was bullied. I think a lot of people. Yeah. 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 So I, I started with, uh, jujitsu, not the Brazilian type, but, uh, I started with jujitsu and then up through the, up through the years, you know, I, uh, got into like karate, uh, go judo karate. I got into judo. And then in 1994, um, I decided to get into Aikido. Um, yeah. So since 1976, I've been practicing martial arts, uh, about, well, about you know, 10 years ago, I moved to Japan to intensify my martial arts training and deepen my, my study. So in a nutshell, I guess that's my, my history. Well, there we go. And you, you, uh, you sent me a video uh, just before the interview of, of you doing a, a, a core. You look like a kata, kata type practice. Yes. Uh, so you have some background as well in, in uh, what is it? Uh, Nitin Nichi Ru, is that right? Uh, yeah, I, right? I train in and I teach uh, Hyoho Nitin Nichi Ryu. So that's the style created by Miyamoto Musashi. Mm -hmm. uh, so a two sword, two sword system. I've been teaching that for 15 years. Um, I, well, I've been running a class here in Japan as well. So, which is an odd thing being not Japanese teaching Japanese people, Japanese martial arts, which is, and especially old martial arts, which is kind of odd, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> when I visited Japan, there was a, an instructor there that was teaching classes, also, uh, American. Ironically, he was also from Minnesota, from up in Duluth. He moved over there and was teaching Aikido in Japan. So when I visited, I, you know, met a guy that, was two, that grew up two hours from where I live that's over in Japan teaching. Uh, so I get to take one of his classes. Very inter interesting. Uh, yeah, there's a, he said the there's same a few thing. of us. Like, it's a little odd here, me being an American <laughs> teaching Japanese uh, Aikido. Uh, but Yes, uh, it, is, it is odd. <laughs> Um, yeah, currently I, I practice, well, Hozoen Liu Spear. Mm -hmm. um, I teach, as I said, Niten Ichi Ryu. Uh, I also do, well, I teach Yoshinkan Aikido. Um, I also practice Iai, uh, Muso Jiki De Nation Liu Iai, and Kendo, and I also practice Zazen. So. Okay. You yeah, got a and I work. Busy schedule then. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I work. Nice. Okay. So. Very cool. Yeah, there's a number of those subjects. I mean, I, I, I spear was one of my favorite weapons uh, in the the competitive arts that I would do. Uh, loved it probably more than anything else. Even though I did some two sword work and 
And that's one of the things I was very curious to talk with you about is, is your exposure to Musashi's uh, sword, sword school. And I've seen a little bit of footage, but there's not very many practitioners out there that study that. And what little I've not seen seems to have, it was a, a rather uh, explosive kind of take control of that first interaction uh, sort of sort of approach. Not, I wouldn't classify it as defensive at all. It's a very offensive style. Would you say that that's correct? I, I would completely agree with you. Yes, compared to maybe some other schools of swordsmanship, Niten is absolutely a very, well, Irimi is the most, one of the most important concepts that exists inside of Niten. So right. it's probably one of the things that really drew me to it in the first place, that there's not a lot of waiting and um, yeah, it's not defensive. It's actually a very offensive style. So. Very much seize control. In fact, in some of the, the HEMA and the European swordsmanship that I've, I've studied, it looks like a lot of the, the authors that wrote how to survive sword combat had pretty much the same approach. Like you explode on somebody and see, you seize that momentum. You don't let them basically either come towards you or get that sort of downhill roll where they've got momentum and then you have to face it. It's take it, take control of the fight before that momentum builds up. And I think, well, I think the Japanese yeah. put that well with the, the Irimi, that entry part. Um, of course, the language the Europeans use is quite a bit different, but if you dig down to the meaning, it seems to have that same element of, it's a combination of surprise and just explosion and intent and make the other person respond to you versus you wait until you see an opening that may or may not ever, ever show up. Mm, well, ab yes, absolutely. I agree. Yes. Yeah. And I found the same doesn't really matter what the weapon is or if it's empty handed, the principle is still the same. If they have to respond to you, they are on the defensive and, and you have initiative in your favor. And, uh, and that's, the, I guess, the as aspect of Aikido that, that as I came up, I saw was a lot of instructors tend to drift towards the Tenkan or tends to drift towards the reactionary side of, of the art. And they often will, uh, I guess, be a little sheepish about getting into the heavy Irimi part. <laughs> um, well, you, you know, it's interesting. We should... Well, I absolutely agree. It's one of the things I've noticed in Aikido is that I think people misunderstand that Weishiba Morihei Sensei never used the words Irimi and Tenkan. Really? He used okay. the words Ilimi and Irimi Tenkan. So okay. enter and enter and turn. Mm, okay. And if you actually really watch video footage of him, he never really waits for his uke to attack him. Mm -hmm. He's already just ever so slightly moving in. Mm -hmm. and hitting so okay. entering and hitting or entering and moving and taking that kuzushi before they actually get the attack off mm -hmm. and it's one of the things i found works for myself as well is i don't wait i mean if you're if you're already flat-footed i mean it's like boxing right if you're a boxer if you're standing there and you got your feet flat on the floor you're gonna have a hard time dealing when pressure comes in you have to be already sure. in a kamai in a position to take to well, seize, seize the moment right right exactly one of the things as i was starting to play with this uh pretty deeply in the, in the first couple of years and actually connect my com competition experience to aikido the way that i would describe it because a lot of times my fellow students or what you know as i started teaching people like how do i describe this to somebody that has no martial experience before no competition experience like how, what language could i use and that is that if you're coming forward towards somebody, you're kind of messing with their targeting computer. If you're standing there still, their, their mind can say, I know exactly where the target is and I'm gonna, approach, I'm gonna plan my approach, whether that's a, a strike with a weapon or strike with a hand or, or even just a grab. I know where the, the target is that I'm grabbing, it ain't moving. But as soon as it starts mm -hmm. moving, especially coming towards you, there's something that happens that changes that interaction very profoundly. Uh, and it makes the attacker, or uke in this, this case, concerned a little bit because the target's coming towards them. And, uh, mm. and I think that changes the, the interaction so profoundly. Um, you know, from a fighter or pressure standpoint, when two fighters face off, the ones, the one, they're kind of vying to see who can apply pressure when the other one's not ready. And then when they see that opportunity, when they get it, 
that's when they 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 press their irimi, and uh, and and I see that very same interaction uh, from an aikido standpoint as long as the two practitioners that are doing it are not just doing dead kata where they're they're going uh-huh. through motions. Um, right, right. I mean, there's a time to train your body to do the right motion, but if you're lacking that intent part or lacking the uh, that how are you, how are you dealing with this opponent and their targeting computer and your targeting computer and taking control of that interaction? If that part's missing, then you're really just kind of going through motions. Uh, uh, true. Yeah. True. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, one of the other sayings I like that Weishiba Sensei used to say was, well, you know, Aikido wa odori jinai, which in English means Aikido is not a dance. <laughs> yep. So. Yep. Yeah, and I don't like dancing. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so. I, I'm not terribly good at it. I will say that, but <laughs> but what I do well is is establish time and break time. So, and maybe that's part of part of just me. But uh, the rhythm or establish the rhythm, break the rhythm. That's why mm-hmm. I guess I'm not a very good dancer, as I break rhythm too much. <laughs> well, that's good though. I mean, yeah. one of the things I think in a training paradigm on how things work is first you have to understand rhythm, mm-hmm. and if you can understand rhythm then you break rhythm, you right. know, but you can't break rhythm if you don't understand what rhythm is, mm-hmm. in that's, my opinion. That, that's true. Yep. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier too, and you said that you had uh, some background with bouncing and with uh, security working for, I think it was a hospital or something you said, a health? Yes. Health well, I, yeah, I, I was a bouncer and then from bouncing, I went to uh, doing security on, in low income housing in a mm-hmm. big city in Canada. I'm from Canada, mm-hmm. so a big city called Toronto. And then I worked uh, in a hospital doing security in Toronto, mm-hmm. which was about for about 10 years. So I have over, over 20 years experience in the security field. That's now I'm an English teacher, which is just <laughs> ridiculous, but yeah, but uh, yes. So. <laughs> well, the health field uh, is one of those that, that I think Aikido can really uh, bring a tremendous benefit to somebody who is who works in a hospital. Maybe they're an EMT or or work uh, they're in, you know in an ambulance or or some kind of field where you're dealing with people that are either injured and frightened or they are maybe on drugs or on um, just in some kind of an emotional state. They're panicked perhaps and they're they're attacking not maybe not meaning harm but they're just tremendously frightened but you as a professional have to deal with them in a way that is not like a sport fighter or a you know a military type art would deal with somebody it's a controlling kind of a thing and we've uh, had a couple I've had a couple of guests on recently that come from the bouncing experience but I, I'd like to get your input on how you felt that Aikido fit well for dealing with that venue of self-protection when you need to protect both both you and the, the your attacker well my, that's a that's a good point because you do have to take into consideration the the well-being of the person that you're dealing with because doctors don't look too kindly on busting up patients you know and, <laughs> uh, and well also lawyers don't look so good on it either yep. so the the thing is is that so for example the hospital that i worked in in toronto had a large crisis unit. Um, so what that would be is they would bring in, so all, the, the head of the emergency department, the doctor went to all the police stations in Toronto and said, if you bring us your mentally ill or suicidal uh, suspects, we will clear you quickly and then hold them on what they call a form one. So form one in Canada is a mental health form that they can, the hospital can hold you against your will for up to 72 hours. Mm. Um, that you have, well, basically you have no rights. You can't leave. Mm. Mm. A lot of people would get brought in on that. And well, needless to say, they didn't like it. <laughs> so, I mean, you would have maybe like an 80 year old man inside this lockdown room who's got Alzheimer's or dementia. And you can really sympathize with him. I mean, he's ill, sure. you know. Mm-hmm. But then you also get some guy that's like 20, he's a gangbanger, and he's done an eight ball of coke, and he's all ratcheted up. And now you've got him in there with that 80 year old man, you know, mm-hmm. who's got dementia. And well, it's just bad. It's a bad mix. Sure. 
So you would, I would be in there with a nurse and I would be there to ensure the safety of the nurse and the patients. And well, absolutely. I mean, when you got CCTV cameras everywhere, so you absolutely have to uh, mind how you deal with people, you know, not even just on a, I mean, morality absolutely steps in. I mean, you have a moral obligation in how you deal with people, but also in a legal sense as well. I mean, as I said, you can't go like just smashing people up. It's, it's not you know, a little ground and pound on granny is not really acceptable. You know what I mean? So, you, you know, but then you also have issues with HIV infected people. I had one girl that one time was, she was HIV positive. She came in, she was, she said she was suicidal. She was a very angry young lady. And if they went to take blood or she would cut herself, she would actually throw her blood at us. Wow. I remember one time she snapped the, the, the nurse went to take blood. And after the nurse took the blood, she snapped the, the needle out of the nurse's hand and went to stab the nurse with the needle. Mm. And I mean, you're dealing with a person that's HIV positive, not like you suspect she's no, she is, right. you know, mm-hmm. it's one of the things that I always, with my experiences in bouncing and security and hospital security is I always found kind of interesting is I like the UFC. Mm-hmm. I really respect those guys. I mean, they're, they're athletes. They, they put things to the test and really it's one, but one of the things that I, one of their catchphrases, you know, um, as real as it gets, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? And I'm like, as real as it gets, sure. Yeah. I mean, you can't have it completely reality, but do you have a person that's like on PCP? Do you have a person that's on an eight ball, a Coke, do you have a person that's HIV positive that you're dealing with that you got a needle? We're not even talking about knives that people slip in on themselves right. or, or whatever else there. I mean, I had one guy in the hospital sitting there. The nurse calls me and says, you know, Oh, Reg, there's a guy smoking by the, by the emergency entrance door. So I'm like, okay, which is unallowed. So I walk over to tell this guy, just please stop smoking in front of the emergency door. As I get there, this guy's a unit, like he's built. Mm-hmm. And he's sitting there and he's using a razor blade and he's peeling layers of skin off of his shins. Oh, wow. So, I mean, that was a piece of information that was not given to me when I arrived on the call. I'm going thinking I'm dealing with a guy who's just smoking. I walk up and here's this guy literally taking a razor blade huh. and shading layers off of his flesh of his shins. Wow. And he just stares at me and blood's pouring everywhere. Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, sir, apparently you're not quite well. Um, so it was a matter of getting him in the hospital, which he didn't want to go and getting the razor away from him, which he did not want to give up. It was an interesting day. So (laughs) sounds like it. Well, and you know, as a young man, I, I, I met this guy and he worked as an orderly in a hospital and, um, he was a taller guy, you know, young strapping and this older, I think he was about 70 years old. uh, He was this orderly had to deal with him and whatever they was doing, this old guy didn't like it. And he started swinging and punching and being, you know, elderly man, probably not a very credible threat, but it was enough that this guy, he, he didn't know what to do with it. He had no way of controlling the, the, the body of this 70 year old man. And somewhere in the tussle, he just said, I've had enough of this and then slug the guy. And that was the last day he worked in healthcare. So it, he was never prosecuted, but he also, that ended his career. Like if he, if he had any aspirations to work in healthcare again, that was dashed and he had to go find something else. So there are a lot of threats yeah. to, you know, you can win the, win the battle, but lose the war. And, uh, and that's where I think Aikido uh, the, and the techniques of it really do come through for when you do have somebody, it's not a cage fight necessarily, but you have, you have to control somebody and do it effectively. Um, it seems like. Well, you've got to you understand MTs taking and angles. What's that? Mm. They said you have to understand taking angles and you right. know, mm-hmm. she, the man's in a wheelchair while his mobility is limited. So mm-hmm. and they, everybody can be a can be a, a you know a sidearm or what are the hell they call that? Uh, uh, Nantaka quarterback. Uh, oh yeah, Monday morning sorry. quarterback. Yep. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Yep. Thank Monday morning so quarterback. Yep. Ten years, I start forgetting English and I teach it. Isn't it? <laughs> isn't it? So oh, Monday yeah. morning quarterback. Right? Yep. Exactly. So, I mean, everybody can sit and say, well, you should do this and you should do that in the moment. It's well, the moment is the moment. Right. So, yep. exactly. Uh, you know, and, and life can surprise you when when, like you said, you had no idea that you were going to walk out to a razor blade wielding, bloody 
mess. You just thought you were getting a guy who was smoking. And, and the number of times you hear about people surviving violence or, or, you know, they're like, I didn't know when I got up that day, I was going to be in a fight or be attacked or, you know, uh, whether it's an abduction attempt or, or some other crazy thing, they, you know, they'll usually say, I got totally taken unawares. Um, you know, I didn't expect it. And, and that's something I think that's different from a lot of the sport fighting is, you know, who your opponents are going to be, you know, about them well in advance, you know, who they are, what their strengths are, what their training is, you can adapt your training to them. And you know that the, the engagement is going to be fairly limited. Uh, whereas, you know, in real life, you don't know if you deal with four or five people, weapons involved, what condition you're in, are you tired? Are you um, exhausted? Are you know, are you sweaty? Is it raining? all kinds of, is it nighttime out, could be anywhere, you know, that kind of thing. So I think that that makes that reality realm of violence very difficult to deal with. Um, well, you bring up some really, really valid points. I mean, one environmental situation or environmental factors that, that are there involved in it. But the other one that you bring up that, again, going back to say, for example, UFC, mm -hmm. if you look at the early UFCs and the Gracies, well, Hoist Gracie to be precise, you know, no one knew what BJJ was and you know, mm -hmm. he was smoking people left, right and center. But then as people then review tapes and and study, you know, study. And start knowing your game plan, you watch how then it all changes mm -hmm. because, well, they're aware of what you're going to do and they adapt to it. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes this is one of the things that maybe made a big difference for our martial ancestors, you know, for example, here in Japan, let's say Miyamoto Masashi, he fought 60 duels and was in six wars, you know, and was never defeated. Nobody had any video footage. Right. There was no, there was no videotape. You couldn't, no one could sit back and watch on a Saturday night, you know, get the boys together, get a pizza, grab a couple of beers, you know, sit down and watch and then say, oh, okay, that's what he's going to do. Mm -hmm. You know, didn't exist. Yeah. So, I mean, everything was a, every day was a surprise, right? Mm -hmm. You know? But and now that surprise was, they can was part of the, the culture where schools, Koryu schools did not want to have anybody see what, how they practiced or how they trained or what their, what their techniques were because they didn't, they wanted it to be a surprise and it would be over by the time somebody would start to see what it was. Wasn't have you true? ever heard of a man, have you ever heard of a man named Nakayama Hakudo? No, that name's not familiar. Uh, he was a friend of Weishiba Morihei Sensei's. He's the guy who was the, he, Weishiba Morihei Sensei had a daughter that was married to a, um, um, married to this kendo guy, mm -hmm. uh, Nakakura Kyoshi. I was stumbling on his name for a second there. Mm -hmm. So his, his Nakakura Kyoshi's teacher was Nakayama Hakudo. He's kind of considered the father of, modern EI in Japan, but also he was in, so he was an eighth down in EI, an eighth down in Kendo, and an eighth down in Jodo. Okay. So he used to go into his dojo at three o'clock in the morning with the shutters closed and everything else and no lights on to practice his uh, tokui waza, his, uh, his specialty, mm -hmm. so that nobody could see it. So yeah, you're right. They used to, they used to take that stuff really seriously. Eh? Sure. They would never let anyone see what their specialty was. They would hide it. Even from their own students, they would hide it. Well, and that, that seems to be an oddity in, in our age because an art tends to, to stay alive by the fact that it gets passed along. And I, I've heard of many arts that have they've been so careful about those, those close secrets that they'll train a lot of the students in some of the you know kind of average sort of things to keep students, but they'll only take maybe one or two select people to, to inherit the art, to be the soke or, the, or to, to carry it on. And then something happens to that person. They either die prematurely, something happens to those secrets, and then the, the, the rue is basically destroyed. It, it, there's nothing left of it. And the records, whether they're written scrolls or documents, either if there are any they're lost or if there weren't any if it was just oral tradition that was passed on in teaching it's just lost to time and i think that that's a real shame when you have that lineage because the japanese do have an unbroken lineage to these warrior arts which for example in europe there's there really isn't any they're trying to recreate that those those techniques the fighting style uh, from documents of that age, but there's not that living lineage. And, and I think that 
there's a strength in having a living lineage, but there's also a, a, an opposite side, which is what happens when either that line breaks or, or the teachings get so diluted over time because they're not actually, there's not a practical side to the training part where it becomes too ritualized or too um, formal and it loses that intent part. Would you, would you say that that's a fair? Oh, uh, fair well, stuff? absolutely. I mean, the, the biggest problem that faces martial arts is martial arts. When I mean martial arts, I mean like traditional Japanese martial arts. I, I can't speak for other countries' arts, but for Jap Japanese traditional martial arts is relevance. Mm -hmm. How can you keep what you do relevant to people now? Mm -hmm. And the relevance of what, how you train now changed as well. I mean, you mentioned like schools, like only teaching a very select number of people, like one person or two people, because they had to keep their stuff hidden. They had to keep it hidden because there was an everyday threat of what they call dojo yaburi or taru jiai. You know, so dojo yaburi is someone comes in and literally like fights your school. Now, you, you ever see uh, Bruce Lee's Fist of Fury? Remember? Yeah, a long time ago. Yep. Yeah, so they call the Japanese guys. Are yep. in their They're all wearing their hakamas backwards. Backwards, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that one. Yes. So Jet Li actually did a remake of it that I, okay. I thought was better done. No disrespect to Bruce Lee because sure. I actually adore the man. He's, he's mm -hmm. a legend. But, oh, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, anyway, so he would go, Bruce Lee goes in and he beats up the whole school. Well, that would be Dojo Yaburi. And that used to happen here all the time. Mm. It doesn't happen anymore because right. it's a really safe country and they just you know and everything now is about character development so mm -hmm. there's, there's that doesn't exist and i think when you don't have that immediate need that there's no no relevance to like, well why am i doing this why am i going to spend all these hours doing this i'm not going to use it you start spending less hours doing it and, and i think a certain amount of the edge is taken off of it you know sure i mean i'm not promoting don't get me wrong i'm not promoting like go out and like kicking someone's dojo's door and like, you know, mm -hmm. smack them around. Like guys, I'm not promoting that, but, but I think that that had a, a large impact on what happened. To them. Why well, I, I know in Canada, I mean, you look at how many Nick dojos there are and, mm -hmm. you know, they, they're, they're great. They've, they've got wonderful programs that they teach kids and take parents money and, you know, do their little babysitting service. And you know, if, it's, if it's a positive impact on the kids, that's, you know, it gives the kids something to do. That's awesome. I, I completely right. applaud them. But I think if you were to have like a switched on individual decide that they were going to go and like challenge the school, the teacher would be in a lot of trouble, probably. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. Well, it's up to mind too, the, the idea that you have a, a secret weapon, like you're, you've got within your art, you've got some, something nobody else knows about when you, when you do it, they'll have no idea how to counter it. Um, and, and I've run across fighter, competitive fighters that took that approach. But what I've noticed was the best fighters, they don't care if, they, if you know what they're about to do. They're so good at doing it that you can't stop them. And that's what they focus their training on is, is being of such high quality with their execution. They know how to set up what they're going to do. They know how to sort of manipulate you into a, a bad position that by the time they do what their, their specialty is, you you're pretty much don't have anything to, to answer for anyway. Like it's that setup part and dealing with a live, a live opponent. Now, of course, with live swords and real spears and stuff like that, you kill each other doing it. You couldn't do it. You have to have some kind of a safety mechanism, whether it's a combination of armor and blunted weapons or something. But it's really that setup that I think is the, the element, that, that crucial element to winning. And I think that, that that's something Musashi had. I, I, have not seen it, of course, any video. He died, what, 600 years ago? But um, with, with about, somebody who almost wins... Almost 400. 400, yeah. With somebody who was that successful, every time I've seen people, f live fighters that are success that successful, it's always been they've had that, that vision. Like, they can see what their opponent is about to do or they can influence it in such a way to create openings that they can exploit, and they're really, really good at it. And it doesn't really have as much to do with how physically or technically precise they are with their movements or how well they, um, they, they execute their technique or movement. It's when they do it and what position their opponents in when they do it. Um, 
I've seen people that are not very technically precise win a lot of fights because they had that specific vision, whereas other people had much more technically accurate footwork, better balance, more precision, but they just didn't come up, uh, come out on top because they didn't have that mm. vision part. And I think that's, that's a fascinating thing about Musashi. And I, I would love, I'm sure I'm one of millions of people that would love to see what he must have looked like when he fought. That you, you, you and me both, considering that I, <laughs> yeah. I teach, I teach his school. I would love to have seen what he could actually do, you know, mm -hmm. or how he, or not, not what he could, there's enough written evidence on what he could do or what he did, but mm -hmm. I mean, to actually see it. Right. I, well, yeah, and I do remember some of the, the stories and I don't know how accurate these are, but he seemed like a master of just getting people off their game, whether it was making them wait for eight or eight, seven or eight hours after the appointed time they were going to meet and just let them sit and stew and just get angry and then face them or jump them early, show up before they even are, you know, as they're getting to the site of the duel and ambush them and uh, just do crazy things that he, what is it? He never like took a shower, never took a bath. So he probably stunk. So to, to a, a civilized person, he probably was like, get away from me. You know, anything he could do, it seemed like to capture their mind and their spirit. It was, he seemed to do that. Now, I don't know if a lot of these are legends and they're not accurate, but, um, you know. Well, legends are, well, I mean, I, I've, I've had discussions with people, especially in the Koryu community where they're like, well, is it really true? What well, you know, like how really good, how, how good really was Musashi years? And I'm like, well, you know, Everybody who knows has been dead for almost 400 years. I mean, right. like everybody who was there, right? Yeah. So whether it's like, was he that good? And I say, yes, well, I wasn't there. So how can I prove it? But you say he wasn't, well, you weren't there. So really, how can you prove it? Right. I mean, the proof for me anyway, the proof is not that important. Is It's an image. It's... Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I, it gives me something to strive for in my training. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it, 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 it encourages me to train harder. Mm -hmm. So whether true or not true or what is true and what is not true is, is really irrelevant because it's what, what compels me to push myself, you know? Sure. Well, and it is true that in an age where, where samurai died on a pretty regular basis, he lived to be 70 years old. So uh, 61, actually. Oh, was it 61? Yeah, he, he lived yeah. to be an old man at a time where dying on a battlefield or dying in a duel was not that uncommon. Um, well, considering, I mean, like 60 duels and before the age of 29, you know, mm -hmm. and then six wars. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think the Lady Luck played more than a factor. But I, you're correct. Mm -hmm. I think he was a, an outstanding psychologist mm -hmm. that he could – he really had a good psychological game going on. Mm -hmm. And that was – I mean, if you read the book of five rings, it's, it's most of it's really just about psychology, you know? Yes. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Every time I go and read that book, something new comes out at me. And I mean, I've gone back over it again and again and again. And I, I of course, haven't memorized it. And I remember the first five or six times I would read it. Most of it seemed so cryptic. I just couldn't get it. But it, it occurred to me what that book does is it requires a certain prerequisite knowledge to really unlock what he is saying. And if mm -hmm. you don't have that, if you can't relate to it, it'll just seem like gibberish. Um, but, you know, I, I think you're right. I think this, the psychology aspect is a major uh, underpinning of, of what he's writing about. Um, I, I have two, two points on that. So do you know Horian Gracie? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard of him. So yeah. uh, he was, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I think I'm pretty sure with Horian. He had a really big like uh, fight career in, in Japan here with pride and, and mm -hmm. this and that. You know, his Bible was the Book of Five Rings, eh? He sure. studied it constantly. Uh, sure. I saw this one interview with him and for pride, and he was saying, yeah, you know, the Book of Five Rings is my go-to book. I mean, mm -hmm. Joe Rogan actually, I think, says he studies that book a lot, you know? Mm -hmm. So, but... Uh, you know, one of the things you're, you're right, it does take a certain prerequisite knowledge to understand and unlock what's inside of it. And I know some people have written that the Book of Five Rings was written as a, like to sell Musashi's school, which is absolutely not true. He wrote it just before he was, or like to sell himself. 
Well, he wrote it just before he was going to die and he gave it to his students and he actually told them to destroy it. Hmm. Oh, I but never heard students that okay. being good, yeah, students being good students, they ignored him and didn't destroy it. <laughs> well, they made their own, they, they destroyed the one he wrote and they made their own copies. They copied it first and then destroyed it. Yeah, yeah. copied it and destroyed it. You know? Okay. But it was so technically it was they followed the door order, but yeah. Yeah, yep. Yeah, they did what he said, but like good students everywhere, they found they found a loophole to sure. you know to, to get the but it was basically crib notes. I mean, here sure. I teach you, now here's here's the in Japanese, they have the kind of they call kuden, so like um, uh, oral traditions, oral teachings. Mm -hmm. So like here's the capstone. Like here I've taught you this. Now here's the capstone. Write this. You know I'm going to write this down. This will cement for you what I was trying to teach you physically. Mm -hmm. That's really what the Book of Five Rings was about. Sure. You know. And I remember how many times I read the phrase "now go study" or "now study on this" or "you must study on this." Um, yes. So it's like here's the seed. Now now you go water it and and practice and make it grow essentially is yes. the feel I get from it. Let me ask you that. I've got a, I've got, a, I had a theory about why uh, Musashi tended to use wood, wooden swords and duels. He avoided using the metal. I think he did his first one-on-one -on -one duel with, with steel and the rest were all with Boken. Um, and that is, it, it seemed like if he was a traveling Ronin essentially, or, or free samurai, Blade, metal blades take, would take a beating under regular combat, whereas wood would be cheap, easily available. You wouldn't have to have it repaired or, or fixed or worry about it getting broken. Um, but a wood sword moves different than metal, than a, than a sharp metal mm. blade. You, there's ways you could kill people with a sharp metal blade. You can't do that with wood. But the wood takes a lot more power. So if you're really going to kill somebody with wood, you've got to have very good body mechanics. Uh, behind it. Um, and, but uh, my thinking was he probably took wood, a wooden sword merely for convenience. And in fact, it was cheaper to maintain or get his hands on. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Or have you ever thought about why? Oh, it's, I, I thought, well, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it was more than one of his fights. He actually used a steel sword, but, but that's, mm -hmm. I didn't, I'm not sure exactly how many, but yeah, it's very few. Comparatively. He, well, yeah, he used, mostly he used Bokuto or like wooden swords. Mm -hmm. um, some people have said, you know, like when you do like, for example, kenjutsu, so like, you know, sword training and you use a, a bokuto or you know, boken, mm -hmm. you know, people are like, oh, well, it's for safety. No, it, it's, no, it's, it's not. not safety. It's no. the, 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 the silliest thing you can have in your brain is that this is now safe. Mm -hmm. Will it cut you? No, running your hand along it, it won't cut you. It's a case of economics, not a case of safety. A shinai, you know, the bamboo kendo sword thing, mm -hmm. that is a that is built for safety. Mm -hmm. A bukuto is just economics. And as you said, I mean, you know, like if you're getting off and fighting like ten people or whatever, you did, your sword's gonna get yeah, it's gonna get abused, and mm -hmm. that's expensive to replace and expensive to repair. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is that. Um, and there is a few cases, for example, when he fought uh, Yoshioka Denshiro in uh, Sanju Sangendo, uh, one of the Yoshioka family there in Kyoto. So he'd fought the first brother and then he fought the second brother. Well, Musashi's father was actually a master of uh, jute. So it's a, a small iron bar with a little prong on the end of it, yep. um, but also was a master of jujitsu. Okay. So Musashi actually was in the writings that I've researched around here was actually really well known as a master of jujitsu, but that he was more famous for his swordsmanship. Mm. And so the thing is, is that he would take the weapon away from the person. So with this, for example, this battle with Yoshioka Denshichiro, or battle, not a battle, a duel, mm -hmm. he actually took the guy's sword away and killed him with his own sword. That's oh, okay. gangster. Oh yeah, that is, <laughs> <laughs> that's tough. That's tough. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You know, not only am I going to kill you, I'm going to kill you with your own sword. I mean, if someone said that to you in the beginning of a fight, yeah, I think I'd probably like that. Eat, that eat at you a little bit, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, and I also I wonder too, like especially when you get a, you know young samurai wants to go prove himself against Musashi, challenges him to a duel, you know, whips out that katana, and Musashi is like, oh, I'm going to use a piece of wood and I'm going to beat you like a dog. I wonder if there was a psychological element to, I'm not even. Well, I think beneath me, actually using a blade on you. 
you know, it, it's it's that you're you're actually hundred percent on there because uh, have you ever heard of like uh, Sasaki Kojiro? So the Battle of uh, Gangyujima. So that famous fight, he fought the demon of the Western provinces, Sasaki okay. Kojiro. He That's the one that where he rode out to the island and, and he. Yes, yes, him. yes, yeah. yes. I do. Remember. So Sasaki, yeah. So Sasaki Kojiro had this sword that was excessively long, and it was called the drawing pole, and he had this. Uh, Tsubame Gaishi, this, his specialty technique. So this returning swallows cut, mm -hmm. whatever actually that, that technique was, I'm not 100% sure. But well, I don't do Ganryu, so I can't say. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, he stood there and he brandished his sword. And so when they agreed, oh, so, sorry, correction. When they agreed to do the fight in the first place, uh, Kojiro said, well, I'm going to use like my steel sword. And Masashi said, that's fine. You, you use a steel sword and you show me all of its like techniques. And I'll use a wooden sword and I'll show you all the techniques of heaven and earth, you mm -hmm. know? Okay. And so he came to that fight with a wooden sword. <laughs> right. So and as was, I remember I the think... story, he carved it out of the boat or as, as they were rowing to the Island and he cut. Yeah. That. That's in the story. I'm not quite so sure who could do that. Right. You know, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Exactly. But, I, but I did I'm hear not, that he, he I'm not made, sold on it. He made that sword longer slightly longer than the opponent's sword and that that's at least what i read i don't know if that's true at all either but no that that is true because i actually have a recreation of it here okay nice and there's a little like divot in the end of it that shows so when he so what happened is this this other family that he was friends with that were in that area where he'd fought and killed kojiro and they asked him years later they said oh what was that wooden sword you used like how long was it so he recarved it Oh, okay. And then he carved a little, like a little almond shaped piece in the end of it that showed this was as long as, this was how much longer it was than Kojiro's sword. Okay. So then he gave them that as a present. So that's how then um, they've been able to, like it was passed down through families or gotcha. through the family passed down for generations. So that's how they can copy it. Okay. Because it's actually still exists. They have the mock so, of it, yeah. Yeah, the mock-up of it. Yeah. yeah, so you actually know it was a matter of like this much was right. the difference in length. And I do recall but, reading that that Musashi did get a cut, a slight cut on his forehead because his opponent got that close to him. So he had that mastery of range. Um, although again, I don't know if that claim is true or not, but this guy, the the, the opponent he fought, was really good with with his sword and and obviously his specialty, his secret technique that was at the returning swallow. I remember yeah, something about a yeah. swallow. Um, you know, obviously he tried it, and uh, Musashi, because he had the range on him, was able to to overcome that specialty and and still win the day. Well, as as uh, well, that's interesting. For one, is so Musashi is very famous for something known as kirima. So like, or sorry, kirime. So cutting with your eyes. So what that really means is is that you can discern the distance by like fractions of an inch, mm -hmm. you know? So if someone's going to cut, he was really good to know distance. Sure. And so you know, a lot of his fights was a matter of just avoiding, just letting, but he thought he was going to, I mean, it's almost like you're going to punch somebody, you think they're there and then they just slip it or they just move their head back just enough that it overextends you and, and now exposes okay. you. Right. Kinda Same like kind of like Ali thing. did. He was, yes, he was the master of that. Yes, same kind of, absolutely same kind of thing. But a uh, funny, well, funny story, a story I like. So that's been brought up before about did he receive a cut on his forehead or whatever. So in his last 10 years of life, he lived with this Hosokawa family down in a city called Kumamoto. Mm -hmm. So when he was there, there was a very uh, strong warrior clan. Mm -hmm. So one of the samurai looked at him at this party. I'm going to try and update the story a bit. So they had a party and said, I heard when you fought Kojiro that you actually, even though you killed him, that you received a cut on your forehead. Mm -hmm. No, Musashi is kind of an older guy and is like mid fifties at this point. So he stands up and walks over and then puts a lantern in the guy's face and bends down and gets like nose to nose with the guy and pulls his hair back. And he says, look closely. Do you see a scar? <laughs> and the guy says, no. And he goes, no, look closely. Do you see a scar? And the guy said, no, absolutely. There's no scar. And he went and sat back down. And the guy who was there when he wrote about it in, a, in his diary, he said that all these other like hardcore warriors, well, as soon as Musashi stood up and walked forward, 
that they all started sweating and everybody like held their breath <laughs> because they were like the whole room got scared. Sure. It's kind of like, you know, Mike Tyson being in a room. He said, hey, Mike, you know, when you're with Robin Givens, and then she, yeah. he like gets up, everybody kind of like goes, okay, whoa. Yeah. 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 Hey, hey, <laughs> I, was, I was just asking. I was just sure. asking. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I never heard that part. That's fascinating. So very cool. You know, we talked a little about, um, uh, just before we started the recording here, a little about the difference between the form and the function. And I think Musashi definitely had the function down. and the form, I'm sure he probably wasn't, you, you talk, look at his writing, he didn't really talk a lot about pr uh, precision of form. He talked about strategy and about applied tactics and about mindset and psychology. Um, so let's talk a little about, about that form and function, especially as the, the, the core you part. And, and I wanted to package this in terms of where you I see Aikido perhaps going or where you would like your Aikido to go. Uh, whether it will drift more into the koryu where it's more of like a formalized ritualized practice or whether it will uh, tend to express or drift more towards the the practicality again to have it be a, a applied an applied art right so form versus function i, I recently wrote about this I'll, I'll i'll copy it and send it to you later where i was talking about form versus function and it uh upset certain members of the Aikido community where they stated that, well, why can't it be form and function? And I said, it should be, it should be form and function. But the problem is in Aikido, as I see it, and I love Aikido. I mean, I've been doing it for 26 years. I teach it, you know, I've never felt that it, 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 uh, in all my years of, of using it in my work, you know, for over 20 years, it, it never failed me, you know, like, I'm not saying I didn't get smacked around a bit. I've got a, I've got a number of nice scars on myself, but, but I'm, I'm alive and I'm sitting here talking to you. So it didn't fail me, you know, um, I, I find that, so there's, there's some people I can look at what they're doing, like, uh, and I'm not disrespecting anybody, please understand that. Anything I have to say is not meant in any way to be negative towards the person. I mean, everything has to be relevant. It has to fit a society with which it's in. It has to, to maintain itself, right? So Shirakawa Ryuji Sensei, I mean, he's Aikikai guy. Uh, really, really, man, the guy's like a dancer. When he moves, it's really beautiful. The problem I find, and I don't really, I don't have a problem with him. You know, the guy is really fit, moves really, really beautifully, moves really well, you know. But I don't see Kazushi. I don't see him taking balance from his uke. Just he has a really good uke who's also very switched on that they follow very nicely and they create a really beautiful dance. Like it looks really nice, you know, you, you watch it. Now, unfortunately, if you watch a demonstration of me doing Aikido, it's not beautiful. I'm kind of like a rhinoceros. I just kind of like slam into people and, and do my thing. But I'm just not, I'm not a guy built to, well, I'm not, I'm not beautiful. So I don't move very beautifully. So, you know, but what I do works. And I think a lot of times in the Aikido community, you have a large percentage of people that tend to applaud the form. So, I mean, I've gone to, seminars and i've seen teachers do things you know kind of the woo woo stuff you know and then you have the uk that's like screaming and crying like you got like driven with like hot coals and i'm like wow really did like that and then i grab the teacher and i'm not resisting him i'm not aggressively fighting him i'm a little bit of a stronger guy physically you know so i get a hold of them and then they try it and they can make it work i but screaming and crying and like <laughs> no, it didn't do that to me, you know, and I've watched, but then I've seen even more ridiculous things like this Mr. Watanabe where he like flicks his eyes or flicks his hands and the UK goes flying everywhere. And I'm like, you know, do we really need that? Do we really need to like portray that out to like the public? Like, now don't get me wrong. The whole love, peace, eternal grooviness, you know, harmony, those guys doing stuff like that. When I, you know, next year I plan to move back to Canada. I want to get back into security because I have a mental problem and I kind of miss my interaction with my fellow man in that sense, you know. Um, 
I would prefer that that's what's on the internet and everybody thinks that's what Aikido is because then if some like really switched on prosecuting attorney decides to research me and says, oh, you do Aikido and everything he sees on the internet is like Aikido's peace, love, grooviness, harmony, and then finds all these Mr. Watanabe's videos, he's going to go, oh, okay. Or if I do like, you know, MMA, and he sit there and he goes and like looks it up and finds up videos on the internet, you know, round and pound and, you know, smashing people up. He's going to form a different opinion of what I did in his brain. He's going to make his own narrative before he even talks to me. So he's already going to like close his mind off. So I would prefer that it's on the internet. I mean, there's my practice for myself and what I do and then how things portray, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, for example, on another, on another side a lot of people talk about the efficiencies or deficiencies of aikido as like a martial art and try and compare it to mma first of all it's the silliest thing you can ever do is compare it to mma it's not mma mm -hmm. how one way it's not mma is your average mixed martial arts professional fight remember we're talking about professional fighters right mm -hmm. you know the professional fighter sits there he trains six hours a day you know he goes to he has a he has a strength and conditioning coach. He's got a nutritionist. He has a, a, a sports therapist. He probably, if he's really switched on, he's also got a sports psychologist to sit there and, you know, get into the brain and teach him how to get the winning attitude and this and that and how to focus. He's probably got a striking coach. He's got a grappling coach, you know, so he's spending, it's a full-time job. That's what he does full-time. If you took Aikido and trained with it in a full-time capacity and, you know, you... With that much support. With that much support. So you had a dietitian and which is not like that difficult to get. You can mm -hmm. actually hire a dietitian, you know, you had a dietitian, you had a, you had a gym coach, you went to the gym, you know, you, you gave the gym coach like, okay, these are my goals. I can't get, you know, too bulky and too muscular, but I've got to, you know, I need to move like this. Functional strength. You, yes. And, you know, and you're okay, you write me a plan, you know, go spot me, make sure I'm, I'm sticking with my plan, you know, mm -hmm. and you treated it like a full-time job. I can guarantee you would probably be a very different animal. Now that said, not just the training aspect of things, personalities. So do you know Jocko Willenick? Willen I probably yep. mispronounced his last, yeah, last I've heard name. Of him. Yep. I've heard some of his stuff. Yeah, I, I like him. I think he's yeah, a, an interesting guy. You know, he's, he's got a lot of really good points and, and he's a very switched on individual. Mm -hmm. Do you think that he's a, now, since you know who he is, you probably know why he's a, a tough guy. I'm not, I don't mean that in a disrespectful way at all I, or in a derogatory, why he's a tough guy. He's an ex Navy SEAL. Mm -hmm. You know, he's, he's a very fit guy. He's a BJJ black belt. I think some people hear that, well, he's a BJJ black belt. So therefore BJJ is going to make me tough like Jocko. No, it's not. That guy could do health Tai Chi. He could do, you know, cardio kickboxing. He would still be a force to be reckoned with. Mm -hmm. He just happens to do BJJ. Right. You so, know, a lot, and a lot of that comes to mindset. I remember reading a book about the origin of the Bud Seal team. And it, this, is, I think, works exactly well with what you were just saying. And, and when they were getting the first group of recruits to bring in for this specialized training, they had a test where they would take two big uh, buckets full of rocks. They'd put them at one end of a pool. You grab both buckets of rocks. You drop in the pool. You get to the bottom. You walk along the bottom until you run out of air. You come up, swim to the top, get some air, swim back down, grab the buckets, and you'd want to get from one end of the pool to the other end of the pool. So there was one guy, and he grabbed the buckets. He jumped into the pool, and he walked all the way from one end to the other and then came up the other side. And the, the uh, instructor was saying, you know, why didn't you, why didn't you come up for air, you know, in the middle? He said, well, I don't know how to swim. He said, that's, that's the guy we want on this team. Like it had nothing to do with his lung capacity or his strength. It was pure willpower and intent. And he said, we'll teach you all the physical stuff. Like, but that mind, that, that heart and spirit to say, I'm going to the other end of that pool, no matter what, like that was what they wanted on that team. And I think when you, when you, have somebody that goes through seal training and you see a guy like Jocko and he looks like a big wrestler. He's got no neck and he's a, you know, big monster. You look at a lot of the seal uh, graduates 
And they're not, they don't all look like that. It's not about no. the physical size. It's about what's in the heart. You'll see guys that are smaller, leaner. They aren't, you know, these mastodons or anything, but they've got that will to win and th that will to succeed. And anything they do, when they get out, regardless, they go for a security job, they'll wind up usually running the security team. They go wherever they do, wherever they go into, whatever realm, they tend to rise to the top because they have that, that spirit of, I, need, I know what I need to do and I'm going to get it done. And there's going to be no excuses. There's going to be no shortcuts, no, you know, tricks. I'm not going to be looking for a way to sort of cheat my way to the top. It's, they just, they work hard and they never give up. So I, yeah. I, that's how I see it. It's in the, the trappings that come afterwards. Oh, I got a BJJ black belt. Oh, I've got this qualification or that skill. All that stuff comes from that, that willpower. It, it's not, those things will give you the willpower. It works in reverse. That's Absolutely. How I, that's how I've seen that. Well, you know, it's, well, one, it's the, the will to prevail, mm -hmm. right? No matter what. Right. And the, the other thing is, and this is, I won't give the full story, but I, I had an, an incident and then it was like a very physically harrowing experience, I guess, you know, it didn't yeah. traumatize me, but the next day was Christmas. So I went okay. to my mother's house and I was in a bit of a, I, I'd worked all night and I was going to my mother's house to do Christmas day, but I'd been awake for like, I did a 12 hour shift and I, you know, met them and drove out to the farm because they, you know, they're, they're farmers and, and I went out there and my one brother's sitting there and he's shooting his mouth off at me. And I said, you know, you want to tell him to like watch his mouth. And my mother's like, well, you know, it's Christmas. And I'm like, yeah, I, I get that. But like, you know, it's not the level of violence that a person is capable of because anybody is like capable of any kind of violence, especially in an emotional state. It's the level of violence that you're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And this is really a defining factor, I think, is not what you're capable, what are you comfortable with? So where's your mindset at? You know, and this is, and I don't think martial arts can teach that. I agree. They can, I, I think if you are around people that have that attitude and you fit yourself in, you can start to change your behavior and you can grow yourself in that direction. But it won't take somebody who's totally timid or passive and turn them into a lion. There, no. there has to be a certain will. And yes, if somebody comes in young and they have a little bit of that spark, and I think Customato talked about this. He says, I'm looking for that young fighter that's got a little spark in him. And then Cus could see it. And he said, my job is to take that little spark and add a little fuel to it and fan the flames and build that into a raging fire. So I think for those people that say, well, I, I don't have this part of me, you, you can cultivate it in yourself. I mean, a lot like uh, somebody picks up a guitar for the first time and they're horrible with it and they go, I just don't have any talent. Well, nobody has any talent when they pick, the, pick it up for the first time. But if it's your will, to become good with it. If it is your desire, then you will put yourself in the company of the people that do that and you'll keep doing it and you'll like it, you'll enjoy it, you'll, you'll grow as a person, as a martial artist. And maybe there is a ceiling where, you know, you really wanna do it. You may not have the desire to be the very best on the planet at it, but maybe you wanna just be really good. You can get to be really good if that is your, where your desire what you have inside you that wants to be that. I think for you and I, since uh, as a kid, I think I was, when I bullied, I, I was bullied, I think it was like seven, eight, nine years old, somewhere in there. But I had a defiant part of in, deep inside of me. And I just said, I'm, this is not going to happen anymore. Well, yeah, that I'll was, figure that out was a way to, to become powerful so that I can stop that. Uh, well, that was my problem. I mean, I was, I remember these one set of kids who told me, you know, they, they, they kicked the crap out of me. And then they said, you know, then that's it, you know, don't walk on this sidewalk again. Mm -hmm. Well, can I tell you what sidewalk I walked on the next day? Yeah, that same <laughs> sidewalk. Right. And I knew I wasn't going to win. Mm -hmm. I knew I wasn't going to win. But I just got that part of me that's like, yeah, you know what? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'd rather take the beating. No. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not suggesting this to people, but sure. it's just my, my character is like that. Yeah. You know, I just, I'd rather take the beating. Well, and I, and I think that there's a, there's a line in there and a lesson that, it's one thing to be defiant and say, I want to not be dominated versus I want to dominate others. And I think mm. when it comes to violence, a lot of people, especially lay people that have, don't have any experience with violence, they say, 
if somebody studies martial arts or they want to become a fighter, it must be just because they want to learn to hurt other people. They want to dominate other people. And I don't think that's the case. That's perhaps how a, psycho, a psychopath or a sociopath might work. But as I view myself as a good moral person, my pursuit of strength is not to dominate others. It's to put the stop to somebody dominating me or somebody dominating a, a, an innocent person. Like that's what we as a society, how we maintain peace is we keep these people that are psychopaths and they don't mind hurting other people and stopping it. You have to be able to stop that. Um, I agree with you hundred percent. That we opens the same a moral philosophical, <laughs> uh, you know, hole to go down because you have to learn violence in order to stop violence. You can't just say, well, well a I'm true pacifist is not a person who is incapable of violence. A true pacifist is a person who is capable of the most extreme violence and then chooses not to. Exactly. Yeah. Anything else is just a weak position. You know, right. if I, well, I'm a pacifist, mm -hmm. you know, but you can't, you're not incapable of violence. It's, it's not a choice. You're a pacifist because you're trying to, you're trying to comfort yourself with, well, I, I, you know, I, I can't, it makes me sick. I don't want to do it because I'm a pacifist. Well, mm -hmm. no, you're incapable. Mm -hmm. Or uh, so I guess saying weak is, is not, not correct. You know, I'm, sure. you're just incapable of it. Right. Mm -hmm. I think a real pacifist is a person who is absolutely capable of the most extreme amount of violence mm -hmm. and just chooses not to. Right. And, and for those people that are, that are incapable, their survival hinges on somebody being at hand that is capable, that will intercede on their behalf and stop them from becoming a victim. And well, the problem with society is, is that everybody looks for, not everybody, a, a majority of people look for that people have like a certain sense. You know what I mean? Like they're like, okay, this is, I will do this, but if I do more than that, it's, it's above and beyond and that would not make sense and it's wrong. Mm -hmm. Like there's a moral compass or a sense, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I think what the vast majority of middle-class people are, are unaware of is that there is a large portion of the population, not, I wouldn't go 50% or so, I'd go maybe like 10% of where that there, there is no sense. There is no, no compassion. There is no heart. They, they don't, they really don't care. So you're thinking that, well, maybe if they hit me, they'll stop when they see I'm a little bit hurt and then you're not going to over. I give them my wallet. There. I'm just here. Here, I'll give you my wallet, my watch or, or my value. Yeah. And you'll okay. Just, away. just leave me alone. Like, you know, it's really like an ostrich with their head in the sand. I'm like, yeah, maybe there's, you know, there's a group of like criminals or a group of, you know, society like that, but there's at least 10% that does mm -hmm. not care. Like they really don't care. And I would not want to hinge my, safety and my survival and the survival of my loved ones on their compassion mm -hmm. you know yeah, you know what i mean that it doesn't exist you know no, that's that's the thing exist. that i've learned about I've, I've got friends of mine in law enforcement and, and people that have had access to that or and seen and navigated in the realm of not quite underworld but seeing the dark side of humanity and it's something that your average suburbanite or the average civilized person living in a first world country probably has never seen other than on a movie screen or on a television set. And that is what happens when you really cross paths with one of those ruthless psychopaths and they, they will, will not, you can beg all you want. You can be as peaceful and docile and polite as you can be. And it, like you said, they don't care. It won't matter. Um, you know, and I've actually met with and gotten some training from uh, police officers, one of which was, he actually did a, a comprehensive study on predators, on how they go target people that they're going to mug or rape or worse, murder. Um, and they have those, these predators have a process because a victim, especially when you feel that your world is entirely peaceful, you've probably never seen an attack, you've never been attacked yourself or ambushed, you don't even realize that these people are out there, but they are, and they'll watch and they'll pick their targets. They will try to find one who's oblivious, who has what they want. If they're, if they're going to, if it's going to be a mugging, they want to mug somebody that's got some money or something they can take. And now everybody's walking around with a five, $600 cell phone. So almost everybody's a target because cell phones are a very popular target, but they'll see, can I approach them unseen? And now with cell phones, as people are buried with their head in the screen, I mean, it's, it's a predator's dream 
to, you could walk right up to the front, front of somebody and they'll never know that you're there. But can you approach safely? You know, are they, do they look like they're good victim material? Are they alone? Do they look helpless? Do they look weak? Do they look like they can't run? Um, you know, they just go through this, like, basically a victim qualifier. Like, this looks like it would be a good target. And then they can choose, well, is the environment right? I look around, is there anybody, anybody here? Any reason why I couldn't, you know, go ahead and do what I'm about to do? And then they approach and they do some sort of an interview where they maybe share a few words with them that, hey, you know, where's the gas station or my car broke down and they get a sense of where the person's mind is at. And this is where I cross up to the Musashi thing. You talk about a master psychologist to see when his victim is weak and then he strikes. But, you know, if somebody's alert, if they look like they're strong, they look like they're, uh, they're alert they can just say, well, hey, thanks. I know the gas station's over there. Thank you for your help. And off they go. They ne the, the victim will never know how close they got to being a victim before mm -hmm. the, the person just said, well, I, I'm going to go for a better target. You know, um, I, I think those are, those are some profound things that it's easy to get in our little safety bubble where we think that the world is a safe and peaceful place, but we don't realize, a lot of people don't realize those psychopaths are out there. Um, you, you know, my friend, let me tell you, I, I, I've been, I've been, oh, that's what's the word, accused of being paranoid, which I don't view myself as paranoid, but life has taught me some interesting lessons. So, for example, when I go into the washroom, you know, in a public place, hmm? I will look, not open the doors, but, but I will look at every, like, toilet stall as I go through casually if there's a broom closet in the room i would actually look at the door you know and then i will position myself where i'm not against the wall but i'm not near the door so i've got some distance okay. if i'm using like for example a urinal mm -hmm. and i'm watching constantly i never take the same route home you know i always take different routes as much as possible to take different times you know just so that i'm not predictable mm -hmm. and i never i'm always hands-free Mm -hmm. I never hold a phone in my hand. I, it's always in my pocket. I don't, I try as much as possible not to text or anything in public because I don't want anything. So I'm on the train. I live in Japan, mm -hmm. you know, but this was things I did in Canada as well. You know, mm -hmm. if I'm on the train and I'm sitting there and I'm like, you know, looking at YouTube or Facebook or something on my phone to kill time while I'm doing my travel, as soon as the train or bus or whatever it is stops and the doors open, my head comes up because I want to see who's coming in, who's getting off, what is the like atmosphere of the person, people getting on the on the transit, mm -hmm. you know, and then I'm watching. And then when I see that, okay, things seem seem okay, I'll go back to like doing something on my phone. But I'm always watching out of one eye. Yeah. That's like, a very bouncer walking. trait. Well, yeah. Well, I never when I go to bars, restaurants, cafes, it doesn't matter. First of all, I sit against the wall. Mm -hmm. Second of all, if it's a restaurant I've never been in before, I go in. The first thing I do is go to the bathroom. Why is it the first thing I do is go to the bathroom? The bathroom is generally at the back of the of the restaurant. While I'm walking there, I want to see how many different exits and entrances are there to this place. Who's in this place? What's the atmosphere, the general atmosphere of the establishment? Where's the kitchen? Because generally the kitchen always has an and also has an exit. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. in it for receiving. So where is that door? Like, where's the kitchen door? And I go back and sit down back against the wall. And I want to keep one eye on the, on the entrance because I want to see who's leaving and who's coming in, you know? And, you know, if there's, God forbid, there was some mass shooting, you know, everybody's going to try and bottleneck out that front door. Well, I want to go out that kitchen door because mm -hmm. yeah, no one's going out that way. And there's also knives in the kitchen. I mean, I ain't going to bring a knife to a gunfight. I'm not stupid. And right. It ain't a movie, you know, but <laughs> But, you know, wherever I can get myself out, you know, wherever I can extract myself, situational and environmental awareness is the number one key, most important thing you can learn in martial arts. It ain't techniques. Yeah. If you've got to the point that you have to apply, in my work, I had to apply techniques. Mm -hmm. And so it was important to study how it works, you know, especially you got granny sitting there, 80 years old. She's got dementia. Am I going to punch her in the face? No, you can't. Right. And I'm not in just a legal stance, but in a moral stance. I mean, you can't. Right. you know um but yeah so more than the technique is just being aware 
one is what is your kamai? How do you stand? How do you breathe? How do you walk? How do you look? Do you keep your head down? Do you keep your head up? Do you make eye contact with people, but don't stare too long? You know, like are you? And that's one of the know? things that that these predators, when when this this officer uh, interviewed a bunch of them, they would all say that I watch how somebody walks. If they if they walk with their shoulder their eyes up and their shoulders back and their chest out and they look like they have some confidence, so I'll just I'll skip them. I'll just, I'm not even going to bother. You don't know. Well, you nature know should, we don't know how the person's, the, what training they've got or what capability, no, what you, background they got. No, no idea. You look at nature. Do you see lions attack hyenas? No. No. Sometimes no. they get in a fight over like prey, right? You know, when they're eating. But basically speaking, you don't see like lions hunting tigers or lions hunting hyenas. Predators mm -hmm. don't hunt other predators. Right. Mm -hmm. You know? So yeah, what true. do you want to be? Do you want to be, you know, uh, do you want to be food or do you want to be a predator? I don't think, personally myself, I'm not a predator. Mm -hmm. And I don't view myself as a predator, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not prey either. Right. So I kind of, I think there's this guy that's got this thing. So they got wolves and they got sheep and then they, they got this thing now they call it sheepdog. Sheepdog. Yeah, I'm trying to remember the author that was, and I, I know the name, but I'm just blanking on it right now. I'll think of it probably He's as I'm cool. going to sleep I, tonight. <laughs> I, I like him. I like a lot of the stuff he's got to say, but I'm like, yeah, you know what? I kind of agree with that. You know, yeah. like, you know, I'm not a wolf. I'm definitely not sheep, but yeah, maybe more of a sheep dog, you know? Right. Well, and that's the thing too, you know, a wolf is uh, viewed as a, even a lion as a, as a ruthless predator, but a, a wolf really is a social creature. Oh, that, and, and yes, you know, lions or, or wolves, regardless, they don't kill for fun. They're not psychotic. No. They, they no. take care of their, pro their either pride or their, their pack. Um, they know their role. They, they step up and work as a team. I mean, there's a lot about the, you know, the analogies that are for humans. Some, some, some of it fits a little bit, a little bit can be off, but I do like the, the sheepdog thing in terms of having a strong protector. I think society yes. needs that. And I think yes, we as does. martial artists, every martial artist that I've met and, and had the greatest respect for, which is a vast majority of them, there, there are some psychotic martial artists out there, but they're yes, in the, in the minority. <laughs> most of them view themselves as the protector of their the, themselves, their family, their community. Like I have a great deal of respect for that. That's, that is really, to me, the, the heart of, of Budo is that you're not just out there to become a beast. You're out there to become a, a, a good beast, one that protects society. Um, so uh, yeah. Completely agree. Absolutely. Well, wow. We, we've run on the clock, my friend. <laughs> and I'm sure we, we haven't even covered a couple of the topics we wanted to talk about, which is some of the spear work and some of the weapons work, but uh, maybe we could do that as a, as a follow-up. Uh, sure. This sure. Is, this has just been a great chat. I've, I've loved every minute of it. Yeah. Myself as well. I really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you very much. Thanks for all the work that you do eh, to try and promote Aikido and promote it in a positive way. I, I, I really respect your work. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Um, yeah, I, I, it, it's been great bringing these people together and have the, have the voices. I like these uh, conversations that I've started doing because there's so many great people out there that have got great insights, such wonderful things to share with everybody. And the more that we can glean off one another, we're, we're kind of going the opposite of that core you that we've talked about where we, everybody's got their secret teachings that they only teach their students. But I think by using this tool, we can spread out and, and get things from each other and we all become better. The, that was it, the rising tide raises all the boats. Uh, right, right. I, I think martial arts and whether it's Aikido or, or even the, some of the traditional Kori schools, the more that they share and they generate the interest, the more that they will, they will flourish in the future and they won't squander off and die because the, their, whatever they have is held so precious that it basically vanishes. I, I, I hate seeing that. So. Yeah, me too. I agree. Very cool. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Reg. I appreciate it. This has been a great chat. Uh, I'm very Thanks, much looking Christian. forward to getting this up. So um, you have a great morning over there, right? Have a great day. Yes, it is morning. Uh, thank you. Have a good evening. Here shortly, so yes. the time zone thing. But uh, thank you again very much for, no. for coming on. Thank you. It. Yeah, please stay safe. I will do it. Thank you. Thank you very much for watching and supporting this podcast. Enjoy your training.